we we are becoming increasingly uh, transactional in the mm. way we do our job. So, you know, we're at home, we're at the office, we have a project to do, we have a note to write, we have something to do. You know, we'll meet for 10 minutes, we'll have a discussion like this, we'll address the issue, we'll move on and we'll produce it and it's going to be very good. But diplomacy, frankly, is, other people have said this, you know, it's, it's a contact sport. Uh, whether it is uh, meeting with people uh, in different environments for a particular topic, but then seeing that uh, flow around to different topics, uh, creating new ideas, creating new contacts uh, that you might not have had initially if you went in very transactionally. Or whether it is just in a, in a place like an embassy like ours, 120 people, uh, the energy that is created by being together is without a doubt being lost. This program represents a three-year-old annual cooperation uh, between World Boston and Harvard's Future of Diplomacy project. And we're so grateful to the project and to its chair, Ambassador Nick Burns. We also thank the Lowell Institute whose funding makes this program possible. The 28, soon to be 27 members of the EU uh, account for 450 million people. And together with the US, we account for something like 60% of the world's GDP. We're bound by strong economic and cultural ties, by mutual security concerns, and many people feel by special shared values. At the same time, in recent years, the US has challenged the transatlantic relationship with concerns about trade imbalances, deficit, uh, sorry, defense burden sharing, and more. The Trump administration has been openly skeptical about the utility of this relationship and has retreated from cooperation, for example, on the Paris Climate Accord, and has sanctioned and curtailed trade. Uh, there's been some of that uh, from the EU side as well. And the pandemic. So we have a few challenges, we could say. So where does this foundational transatlantic relationship stand today at a moment of historic transition and what should and can be done to improve it? If diplomacy is the art of the possible, we have, uh, we are surely in the presence of two masters of that art. I'll keep the introductions short, but you can see more online. Stavros Lambernidis is the ambassador of the European Union to the United States. Uh, since 2019. Before that, he served uh, as European Union Special Representative for Human Rights. And in 2011, he was Foreign Affairs Minister of Greece. Before that, he himself was twice elected uh, member of the European Parliament. Um, and I'd like to point out the local connection. He is a graduate of uh, Amherst College and Yale Law. Ambassador uh, Nicholas Burns is the Roy and Barbara Goodman Family Professor of the Practice of Diplomacy and International Relations at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. He's also founder and faculty chair of the Future of Diplomacy Project and the Project on Europe and the Transatlantic Relationship. So Ambassador served in the US Foreign Service for 27 years in every administration from Carter through George W. Bush and under nine different secretaries of state. Among many highlights, he served as Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs and Ambassador to NATO, and as Ambassador to Greece, um, the home country, of course, of Ambassador Lambernidis. Uh, we have so much to talk about today, too much. But undaunted, we will start. I'll ask each of the ambassadors to make a couple of remarks, and then we'll have some discussion. And then after that, uh, we'll take some questions. So uh, Ambassador Burns, would you go ahead, please? Mary, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with World Boston. Um, I just wanted to say how proud we are in Boston and in Massachusetts, in Cambridge, where I live, uh, of World Boston and of the leading role it plays in New England in trying to connect all of our citizens to global affairs. Mary has done a magnificent job, and I strongly support her mandate and that of her board, and I'm delighted to be here. I also want to say what a pleasure it is to be with Ambassador Stavros Lambernidis. Uh, we're old friends, old comrades in arms. I'm a great admirer of his career. And he's in a very important position here in the United States. The, the European Union is our largest trade partner. It's our largest investor. Europe contains the greatest number of American allies in the world and NATO. And so he's an important link in this bridge between the United States and Europe. And I know we're gonna learn a lot from Stavros today. Mary has asked both of us just to say a few words at the top, then we're gonna have a conversation. So in two to three minutes, 
what might we be thinking of as we think of a transatlantic relationship in 2021? First, I think the new administration, and I'm a strong supporter of Joe Biden, delighted that he was elected as president of the United States, and he is going to be inaugurated on January 20th. Don't pay attention to the tweets of Donald Trump this morning. Um, I think that obviously the burden has to be on the new administration, the responsibility to focus first here at home. I think foreign policy is gonna to have to begin at home because we're in the middle of this really horrific second wave that we're feeling here in New England and across the United States and getting a handle on the pandemic on, on hopefully with the announcement by Moderna this morning, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and with Pfizer last week, hopefully we'll be able to see a vaccine in our future, but it'll take months to work to, to, to have that distributed evenly, if not longer than months in the United States. We've got to get a handle on the recession. We're in a very deep recession and the race problem continues to be a major issue for all Americans. So I do think that it just makes sense that all of us of Americans are gonna be focusing inward on our own country, but we know that we have to face outward. We know that we're still um, the strongest country in the world economically and militarily. We have responsibilities to others as well as to ourselves and particularly responsibilities to our allies in Europe because we have a joint future at stake with Europe. And I think that agenda, Mary and Stavros is pretty clear uh, Vice Pre uh, President-elect uh, Biden is saying he'll return to the United States to the Paris Climate Change Agreement. He'll return the United States to the World Health Organization. We will re-embrace NATO and re-embrace our partners in the European Union. And I think that that's going to be deliberate. It's going to be strongly uh, held uh, as a value of the new administration. It's going to be very welcome for our global position. We certainly need to lift up the State Department. And we can talk about this, Mary. The State Department is in crisis. Morale is at its lowest level in the 40 years with which I've been associated with the State Department. And uh, we will be issuing a, a report tomorrow, a new Harvard University report on a US Foreign Service for the future. And speaking to the World Account Affairs Council national meeting on Wednesday, it's a two year report that's calling for a very broad and transformational change in the way we structure and support the Foreign Service of the United States. Yeah. We right, need to lift up. We I'm need to lift up. Okay. And if people don't mind muting, uh, that would be terrific. We need to lift up the State Department as we move forward. On our engagement with Europe, certainly um, we're going to have to see a congealing of a, and a reaffirmation of the American support for NATO, a reaffirmation of our support for the European Union. We're in a joint fight against populism and anti-democratic forces, both in Europe and even if you think about white supremacy here in the United States. We certainly need to speak more clearly about human rights together. And there's a lot we can do to strengthen this transatlantic relationship. But I, I hope we'll talk today about where our differences are, because frankly, we have differences on 5G between the United States and EU, on Huawei, probably differences on how we should handle China uh, Europe's become the great regulator of the tech industries, California tech companies. Uh, the United States is not always comfortable with that. Defense modernization by Europe is another issue where we need to talk about our differences. And, and trade's going to be a contested issue inside the United States, inside our political parties and between them. I think that's a very difficult area to make predictions on. The last thing I'd say is that... Um, we in the United States and Canada and our allies in Europe need to be acting together on the biggest global issues. That's the authoritarian challenge from China and Russia. It's the challenge for human rights in places like Hong Kong and the Uyghur population in Xinjiang province and in places like Belarus in the heart of Europe, where we need to do a better job of working together. But I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic that you're going to see a resurgence and in, in the transatlantic relationship, a renewal of these vital ties that connect us uh, as peoples because we believe in common values and we have common interests. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Ambassador Lambrinidis, would you like to let us know what's top of mind for you this sure. Monday morning? And, uh, absolutely, and thank you, Mary, and thank you to Word of Boston, and thank you to, uh, to the Future of Diplomacy Project, and particularly thank you to, uh, to Nick Burns, I mean, they, 
uh, truly a friend for uh, for decades now, and uh, uh, he he tends not to toot his own horn enough, but uh, an amazing ambassador when he was certainly in Greece at a, at a very pivotal time, uh, and in virtually every other post that he has uh, he has held, and uh, and of course an academic firepower in his own right since uh, since he uh, he went to Harvard. So uh, always a pleasure to be with. Um, Mary, I start with three general propositions. The, the one is that the EU-US relationship is not a luxury. Uh, whether or not we are conscious about it, it is uh, a necessity. It makes a difference in the lives of millions of Americans and Europeans across the uh, pond every day, whether it is uh, their prosperity or whether it is their security. It has depended on it for decades. And for decades, we have had each other's back. Um, and, um, you know, frankly, we are the friends of uh, first resort. And I think that uh, more than anything else, I look forward to returning to that basic understanding because, of course, uh, there, there are differences. There always have been. But they have never detracted from the fact that it is together uh, when we work uh, that we can make a huge difference for the lives of our people and for uh, security prosperity in the world. Uh, the second uh, basic principle uh, that I begin with is that uh, this is a uh, changing world. We are at a crossroads. Uh, and in fact, um, the more we delay taking common action, the more we'll be leaving uh, black holes of power to be filled by others. And um, whether it is a respect for international law or human rights, or whether it is uh, different ambitions of different emerging powers uh, uh, to control uh, the regions, to bring us back to a might is right uh, kind of world where they feel more comfortable uh, in their own little um, geographic spaces, um, whether it is the multilateral institutions that are the only thing that we know of, we set them up, Americans and Europeans decades ago, uh, to ensure that uh, a world doesn't get fragmented uh, to, um, uh, you know, to a uh, constitution of bullies running around, but, uh, but to real uh, values and interests promoted. Uh, that is something that we, uh, that we have to focus on together. And we have to do it now. The third reality, I think, is that the United States has changed in the past few years, uh, as has Europe. I think the Biden administration will find a more united, uh, a more assertive, a more confident Europe as its partner. And that is the best thing uh, that uh, it uh, probably could uh, hope for. Um, you know, I've, I've been in too many jobs in my life in recent years um, uh, trying to explain to friends in the United States that the European Union is not collapsing. Uh, it wouldn't collapse during the financial crisis. Greece would not leave the EU. The euro wouldn't collapse. And it didn't, of course. It wouldn't collapse during the migration uh, crisis, um, and of course it didn't. Uh, and it wouldn't collapse during uh, the Brexit crisis, and it hasn't either. Uh, you go around Europe today, uh, and you see that um, uh, many more citizens in every single one of our member states says that they like being parts of the EU uh, more than they did a few years back. And if you look at our reaction to COVID, and if you look at the way that we're working closer together, uh, to uh, research and, in, and innovate, to invest in, to uh, deploy more, even when it comes to military capabilities, uh, you will see a Europe uh, that is uh, the best possible ally that the U.S. would want to address some of the challenges of the world. What are they? Uh, very uh, epigrammatically, because of course we'll talk about this uh, later on. Um, COVID, of course, is a major challenge. Uh, and I would say that there what we need to do is we need Americans and Europeans uh, Together with partners in the G7, the G20, uh, we need to set a blueprint on how we deal with um, vaccines for future pandemics, but also for this one here, uh, supply chains, uh, how we deal with tariffs in the pharmaceuticals and other uh, uh, and medicine and other stuff like that. Uh, COVID has exposed these challenges. They will not go away. Another pandemic certainly will come. We certainly also need to work together when we address this one, not just for our own people, but around the world. Now, listen. Solidarity is not charity. Uh, unless uh, this pandemic disappears in every corner of the world, it will, we will never be safe in our own borders either. And we will never be able to have the economic expansion and security we want for the rest of the world as we come out of it. And also, we do need to understand that there are countries out there who are running around trying to act like the new Mother Teresa's of this world, uh, claiming that uh, the West, as they want to call us, uh, is selfish, uh, not interested in what have you. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth, but we need to re work together to, uh, to, to achieve that message. Second um, um, related, perhaps, uh, challenge is the economy. Uh, COVID has hit our, both our economies real hard, and we're not out of the woods yet. 
but we're getting there. Uh, and we're going to get out there better together, precisely because of what Nick mentioned and you, Mary, before. We're the biggest economic artery of the world and each other's biggest economic boosters. If Europe manages to come out of this pandemic um, effectively, economically, as we are doing right now, uh, this is the best outside news for economic recovery in the U.S. as well. And the same thing applies to us for U.S. recovery. We really are in this together. Trade and investment between Europe and the U.S. is unparalleled. We simply don't have anything like that with any country around the world, whether Americans exporting or being invested in or Europeans exporting or being invested in. It's as simple as that. Third challenge, um, uh, and well, I mean, and of course there, that comes to something that Nick said. Um, we need to get out of the tariff track. Uh, we need to look at the major economic opportunities that trade offers, and we need to address some of the trade irritants. Third challenge is uh, the environment. It is not a hoax, it is real, it is happening, and climate is changing, and unless we manage to address this together, uh, we will be in deep trouble in, in a few years from now. We've seen what COVID alone can do to devastate our economies and our health. Just imagine if we don't address the climate crisis, which is going to be by magnitude bigger in its effects on our populations and others. And for us in Europe, this is not just simply a, a health um, imperative for ourselves and our planet. It's also a new economic growth agenda. So we have decided as European Union that working to come out of the COVID crisis by investing massively in, uh, in um, our environmental plan, by becoming carbon neutral by 2050, that's going to be economic power in addition to, uh, to everything else. The fourth thing I would mention is multilateral organizations. Look, I really look forward to uh, the um, U.S. diplomatic firepower. Um, uh, returning to the, to the world stage and to multilateral organizations. Uh, it is no secret that the European Union has been very uh, disappointed uh, by the fact that the U.S. in the past four years has withdrawn itself from a number of multilateral organizations, whether it's Paris or the Human Rights Council at the United Nations or the WTO, uh, where uh, everything has been done to throw obstacles in the uh, instability to function of the WHO. And that's not because of any kumbaya notion about multilateralism. It's because if we don't manage to have joint rules for everyone, then the smaller big powers around the world who don't like those joint rules will be imposing their own rules on their own regions. And that's going to be an economic and security challenge that is going to be much bigger than what we're seeing today. We need multilateralism. And there, I have to say, I'm very proud of the EU. Um, in the past uh, two, uh, few years, we have held the fort. Um, by playing defense, uh, mostly without being defensive, it's time for the U and the US to play offense, frankly, without being offensive in, these, uh, in, these, uh, in this attempt to build uh, a stronger uh, world uh, order based on, the, on law. Uh, finally, values. Uh, the, um, I have to say that uh, another major European and American um, priority of the Biden administration as well is digital. Um, our economies and our societies are changing rapidly. Artificial intelligence is going to be the future. And someone will be setting the standards for AI. And it cannot be those who want to use face recognition or voice recognition to be depressive people's rights. It has to be those who are setting democratic, human-centric standards for these technologies. This is a major challenge and I think a major area in which the EU and the US will be, be able to engage directly uh, when the new administration uh, takes, uh, takes uh, office. Um, and uh, I have to say as well that democracy itself uh, is um, so tremendously precious and so tremendously evolving and developing that we have to begin a really serious conversation uh, for democracy around the world and for democracy within our borders, how to strengthen it, how to make it better. Uh, we in Europe experienced in this last election in the U.S., uh, a remarkable experiment uh, in, uh, in democracy. Uh, in the midst of COVID, more people voted than ever before. Uh, thousands of uh, volunteers and others observed the elections, counted ballots, um, made heroic efforts uh, to, uh, to be able to do all this under the most uh, difficult circumstances and, uh, and very effectively. Um, uh, and I think that is an inspiration. And I think that we have to make sure that the way we run our democracies is exemplary because the rest of the world is looking. 
It's looking on us Europeans, it's looking on Americans, uh, and there are those who want to find every reason, every excuse to claim that democracy doesn't function, uh, that their system, uh, well, you know, maybe repressive, but at least, you know, we're not fighting with each other all the time, we get some things done. So, you know, come with us, come with us, that their system is better, it isn't, it never has been. And it's not today, of course, either. But we have to fortify our democracies, and I look forward to that conversation as well. So um, thank you very much for having me here, and I look forward to the conversation uh, to put some meat on the bones of what we've discussed. Okay. Thank you uh, both. I guess my, uh, my question... Um you know, brings us, um, this, it's a huge array of, of issues and, and not all of them are, are new. Uh, uh, there, there are issues that have existed between uh, the US and, and uh, the EU for a long time and also shared interests. But at this moment, um, both sides are in the middle of huge transitions. Um, sure, everybody's thinking about um, transition on the, on the US side, but you're, you're going through big transitions in Europe as well. Uh, Brexit is about to become real in a few weeks. Um, Angela Merkel will finish out her historic term. And um, over here in the US, we did have a presidential election. Uh, we have a president elect. How does, uh, how does progress get made? Um, even in an ideal transition, uh, these are agenda items that have, have been with us for some time. Um, Nick, maybe you can start that off. Um, how does a diplomat continue to push forward um, as all of these changes are going on, yet the, much of the agenda has been with us? Well, Mary, this is going to be, and this is, already is, I think one of the most difficult transitions in American history, first and foremost, because Donald Trump has done something that no prior president has done, and he's, he's failed to face the facts that he lost the election and that uh, he should have stood aside within 24 hours of that election, recognized Joe Biden's victory, called him, and conceded. And the fact that as of just an hour ago, he's tweeting, I won the election, it's false. It's another one of his many lies. Um, and it's going to bring great discredit upon him in the eyes of history. It's also making the transition, transition difficult. I'm not involved in the transition. I'm not in the transition team. But ordinarily by this time, uh, you, the president-elect, the vice president-elect, and their senior advisors would be um, would have their security clearances. They would be receiving uh, the most important intelligence and military briefings, so they can get up and diplomatic briefings, so that they can get up to speed and take over seamlessly uh, at noon on January 20th. And Donald Trump is denying them the ability to have those briefings, even to have the money to finance a transition. As you heard uh, President-elect Biden say last week. The transition, his transition, is proceeding apace, but there are certain things you can't do unless the outgoing president decides to be um, cooperative. I worked for five presidents. I worked in the transition way back uh, of 1993 when George H.W. Bush had been defeated and Bill Clinton was coming in. I was on the National Security Council staff, and I remember our instructions from President Bush and General Scowcroft, our national security advisor, you are to cooperate in every way possible with the incoming administration. And I did that. I was an advisor on Russia. I ended up staying and working for President Clinton. But that was, the, um, that was the admonition to us. We want to help the new president succeed. There's famously a note that George H.W. Bush left Bill Clinton saying, you're our president now. Your success is our success. We all want to help you. And boy, would it be nice to have a president of the United States who would, who would continue that very good American tradition about the peaceful transfer of power. It's the fundamental base of our American democracy. And it happened for the first time when Washington um, stood down after two terms and John Adams came in. And we've had peaceful transfers with the exception of 1860, uh, that infamous exception of the Southern rebellion against the Union. We've been lucky in our presidents until now. So I think Donald Trump makes it very difficult there's no question, Mary and Stavros, that in my mind, Joe Biden will be very clear both during the transition, I think, and certainly when he's, once he's elected, once he's sworn in, that Europe, um, we're going to return to a full embrace of NATO and the European Union because that's in the interest of the United States. Well, Ambassador Lembronitis, I'm wondering if you can uh, also uh, pick up this topic. Uh, you're in DC right now. 
Um, you are a diplomat. You have to work with what you work with. That's just reality, whether it's, it's good, bad, or indifferent. Um, who, who can you talk to? How can you continue to uh, pursue important agenda items um, during a presidential transition, um, during this one, and during a pandemic? How does diplomacy persist? Um, well, like, like everyone else, uh, uh, we continue working with the outgoing administration on, uh, on every policy uh, issue uh, until there's a transition. And, uh, and uh, I'm happy to say that, uh, that we have established, for example, an EU-US dialogue um, to address uh, how we work together uh, on China. Yes. Uh, and, uh, and that dialogue will, uh, will begin very shortly, and I look forward to, uh, to its continuing with, uh, with the new administration as well. At the same time, um, we are preparing to be able to uh, present uh, a new transatlantic deal proposal to the uh, Biden administration okay. um, as soon as it is, uh, it is uh, uh, ready and able to, uh, to engage with that as well. Uh, so we're doing a lot of homework ourselves. Uh, um, we're not just waiting, sitting back on this, whether it is, uh, and I think that it, it, it gets easier by the fact that if you look at the um, at the uh, agenda priorities that Ursula von der Leyen, the uh, the European Commission President, has set, and, and many of the priorities that President-elect Biden have set, you see that they very much align. So that doesn't address every issue, but certainly in the first few months of uh, of uh, the administration, uh, we hope to be able to work very closely uh, to promote uh, some things that are important uh, to both sides in, as I said, a, a changing world. So. Um, so we're not just sitting back uh, twiddling our thumbs, uh, if you like, uh, and um, and we are very hopeful that uh, a lot of positive can come uh, uh, once we're able to uh, to engage. I think that what you mentioned about the dialogue on China is really fascinating because um, I think in in the press um, that's not that's not the image that's portrayed of international relations right now. So the fact that um, the the uh, Trump uh, State Department is working actively with the EU on uh, relations with China, I think would probably be a, a surprise to many people. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, no, I mean, look, we're discussing, this issue, we're, we're discussing this issue for, for a while. And, uh, and I have to say that in the United States, this is a, uh, uh, one of those very strong bipartisan issues as well. I think both Democrats and Republicans feel uh, that China has to be, uh, and challenges from China have to be addressed, uh, as we do in Europe. Uh, but people also feel in Europe, certainly, and also think in the U.S. as well, some people that China is, is also a very big country that has to be um, uh, uh, worked with and, and cooperated with when, in fact, there are world challenges that it needs to participate that we need to work together to address, including, for example, climate change. So I don't want to uh, in any way imply that this is an, going to be an easy uh, discussion, that everything is clear. Uh, but uh, but I do want to say that uh, that I expect that in a very bipartisan way we'll be able to have this uh, discussion um, uh, with the um, uh, both with this administration and certainly with the uh, with the next one. Great. Um, and, and, I, and by the way, you yes. asked me about diplomacy in this time of COVID. I'll just say this very quickly. Um, I appreciate what we're doing now. We've been doing it for almost eight months ourselves, even in the EU embassy. Um, you know. Um, most people are at home. Um, I have to say I'm supremely impressed by how the EU embassy has been effective and productive. At the same time, I can't uh, shake off a feeling that we, we are becoming increasingly uh, transactional in mm -hmm. the way we do our job. So, you know, we're at home, we're at the office, we have a project to do, we have a note to write, we have something to do. You know, we'll meet for 10 minutes, we'll have a discussion like this, we'll address the issue, We'll move on and we'll produce it, and it's going to be very good. But diplomacy, frankly, is other people have said this you know, it's, it's a contact sport. Uh, whether it is uh, meeting with people uh, in different environments for a particular topic, but then seeing that uh, flow around to different topics, uh, creating new ideas, creating new contacts uh, that you might not have had initially if you went in very transactionally, or whether it is just in a, in a place like an embassy like ours, 120 people. Uh, the energy that is created by being together is without a doubt being lost uh, through this uh, very effective and efficient, but at the same time, uh, very um, specific uh, framework of the VTC. So um, we're taking, as you know, in Europe, uh, the virus very seriously. We took it from the beginning. 
Um, there's no way we're going to make um, any discounts in the necessity to, uh, you know, keep our people safe in the embassy and in Washington more broadly. Um, you know, we, we shut down before virtually everyone else uh, mm -hmm. in D.C. when this uh, came out. We're still uh, bringing a, a, a limited number of people back in the office in a very careful way. Uh, we're telling people to wear masks everywhere. We want to be good citizens uh, of this great country uh, in which we are temporarily here to serve. And we're going to do everything that is in our power as Europeans to ensure that we protect the lives of Americans uh, and our lives as well. Right. So I know that time, we have way too much to talk about. I'd love to talk with you about uh, Russia and uh, AI and other topics, but um, I, I know our audience will have questions too. I'd like to finish with some thoughts from both of you about this notion of values. We talk a lot about uh, transatlantic values, et cetera, but where do you see them? Where, where, where do you feel them? Where do you know them other than reading some document? Um, I've heard uh, you say, Ambassador Lambrinidis, that you know our values are in those containers that are going across the Atlantic full of our goods. Um, maybe you can um, reflect on that. And then, um, Nick, you could round out this portion and then we'll go to Q&A. Okay. So that, where are these values? <clears throat> thank you. Very, very quickly. The, the first one is what you just mentioned. Uh, what, what I very often uh, tell people is that, indeed, um, when, we, uh, when we engage in trade around the world, it's not just money and it's not just goods. It's values as well. We, we put in those containers of values in addition to our goods, Americans and Europeans. We put in those containers respect of labor rights. We've put in those containers respect of free open markets. We put in those containers a condemnation of corruption. We put in those containers protection of the environment. We don't produce cheap goods that can go out cheaply and fast uh, by destroying uh, our environment. So, uh, and other countries increasingly are putting in, those, in their containers their values too. So we have to keep in mind when we talk about trade that it's much bigger than just simply money. And that's where Americans and Europeans, I would hope, can work closer together. A second, final example, uh, take anti-terrorism. Now, let me ask you something. Because sometimes when I went around the world in my previous capacity as human rights uh, chief of the EU, uh, you know, some of the repressive governments would tell me, Mr. Lambrinidis, we're trying to fight terrorism here. Human rights is a luxury. Why don't you just leave us alone? You know, why are you poisoning this conversation by raising human rights? And, and I, would I would answer their, their question with, with my own question. My question was, why don't you just go ahead and tell me what, what's so scary about smart girls? Why is it that Boko Haram decided to abduct the few hundred girls from school as opposed to bombing one more army barracks they're good at? Why is it that the Taliban in Pakistan tried to plant a bullet in Malala Yousafzai's head? when she was advocating for girls' education? Why is it that Nadia Murad, other Yazidi girls in Iraq were abducted, uh, you know, tortured, forcefully married by ISIS? What's so scary about smart girls to terrorists? And if you think about it, the answer is quite simple. Smart girls tend to become educated girls and educated girls tend to become empowered women. And empowered women change entirely the balance of power in any society. And the last thing that a terrorist wants is empowered societies. They want societies with big black holes of power that can fit in with their hatred and with their violence. So look at what terrorists hate. They hate freedom of religion. They hate freedom of speech. They hate girls' education. Look at everything they hate, and all these are human rights. All these are values. And try to protect them if you want to fight terrorists. Of course, you need the guns, and of course, you need the other stuff. But let's get serious here. Okay. Um, Nick, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about how, how we see these so-called transatlantic values in, um, in our work, in our life, and, and why they're meaningful. Well, I do have some thoughts. Um, the values are real. The, it's what brought the United States together uh, with the NATO countries in 1949 has held us together. And that's the rule of law, human freedom, civil liberties, religious freedom, everything that, we've, that are the basis of our societies. And the founding of the United States unites us with Europe. Um, there's no question that the biggest struggle ahead of us, in addition to climate change, is going to be between closed societies and open societies, unfree societies and free societies. China is making a case, listen to Xi Jinping's speeches just two weeks ago, that the Chinese model uh, of authoritarianism is the way forward for much of the world. 
And we Americans, we Canadians, we Europeans don't agree with that. Um, and so I think we've got to fight that battle. It's not a military battle. It's a battle of values. We have to be confident about it. And right now, frankly, I think there's a lot more the US and the European Union could do together. In the United States, both the Democratic and Republican parties have essentially come together on our policy towards China. We're competing with China. We're competing on values. We're competing on trade. We're competing for military positioning, uh, given the United States military position with Japan, South Korea, Australia, India, in the Indo-Pacific. And I don't sense that the Europeans uh, have a fully concerted policy. My sense is, but Stavros can correct me if I'm wrong, that there's still a big debate in Europe over Huawei, over, whether, over 5G. Well, that debate's been settled in, in the United States, in Britain, in Japan, in India, in Australia. We've all said no to Huawei on 5G, but Europe hasn't. And I think that this is a big challenge for the transatlantic relationship. Can we adopt a common policy, uh, not to fight China, but to stand up for our, our human values and to make sure that China doesn't use its intelligence services to get inside our networks. And that to me is, is one of the bigger challenges for 2021 and 2022. Okay, thank you. And I would say, uh, and I would say very quickly to what, to what Nick said that, uh, that we are in Europe as well, um, uh, very woke uh, to, the, uh, to the issues of 5G and 6G and, uh, and the threats to the networks. Uh, and because of that, we have um, uh, collectively at, at 27 member states uh, developed what we call a toolkit uh, to ensure that we can both identify those risks and mit mitigate those risks. Uh, and both risky suppliers and risky countries from which those suppliers may come, including China, have to play by EU rules. And if they don't, our member states, because it's a member state decision, can block them under national security and other uh, reasons. And you've seen this... Uh, Nick, uh, really throughout Europe in the past few months, you'll see a number of member states uh, who have made those decisions, including uh, in terms of excluding uh, Huawei. And I would have to say, it's, uh, for me, it's, it's a bigger issue. It's not just a particular supplier, it's also the way the technology can be used, as I said at the beginning. Uh, and there, I think the EU and the US have a unique opportunity to set standards for 5G and artificial intelligence. We haven't managed to do it yet. It's a complicated exercise. You need companies to be involved, civil society to be involved. You need governments, regulators to be involved. But this is a discussion I look forward to having because um, you know, uh, we have to put our foot down here. Uh, I totally agree with Nick. This is a battle of values around the world. And unless we fight it in a united way and together, unless we set some rules for this game, uh, that ensure that uh, democratic values will prevail on these technologies. We may be in a world in a few years that none of us like. And, and Mary, just one word, uh, one more word to just fill this out for the questions and answers. Uh, we certainly on our side, the United States side, see Europe as our primary partner um, in trade and investment and defense. But we know that there are divisions within Europe. President Macron gave an interview this morning that really talks about strategic autonomy by Europe. Is that separate from the United States? Is it with the United States? I'm, from my perspective, Stavros, I'm just not sure the German and French governments are together yet on that big question. Does Europe position itself equidistant uh, between Ch Beijing and Washington? Or is Europe gonna identify its longer term interests with the United States? So it's something we need to talk out and that the new administration yeah. needs to talk with, uh, with the EU leadership about. Yeah, okay. Nick, I agree. I agree. I think, as always, the German and the French governments very often complement each other in their in, in their positions, uh, and that's how Europe goes forward. There, there are discussions. There's absolutely no discussion uh, in Europe that we are sitting at the same side of the table with the United States. Period. Everyone agrees to that. And strategic autonomy, as we call it, is nothing more than trying to ensure that we develop our own capabilities, whether it is in uh, in being more efficient in what we spend in defense, uh, spending more by spending it more efficiently, whether it is ensuring that, uh, that our economic development when it comes to a digital allows us to be a player and not just stuck uh, in the middle uh, trying to um, uh, you know, fend off the big digital powers. Uh, all these things are done not absolutely not to be against the US, but in fact, it's creating a stronger partner for the United States. So I can assure you, Nick, that although we may have, be having internally discussions in the EU 
as the U.S. is having also when it comes to uh, when it comes to uh, the best ways to deal with uh, China. Uh, that uh, none of this discussion uh, in any way uh, takes us away from the EU-US partnership. Um, when I say everyone is talking about China, what I mean is that we, we do understand that China is complex. It's not the Soviet Union of the old times. Uh, the, the US and its companies are massively invested in that country, and so are Europeans. Um, uh, China is becoming at the same time much more aggressive in exporting its bad values. So in the EU, we have uh, a strategy that identifies areas where we must cooperate with China. We must. Uh, China is the biggest polluter in the world. You cannot stop climate change unless you stop China. And then we identify China also on the other side as a, as a, um, uh, as a um, constant uh, strategic threat when it comes to governance and values. So it's perhaps a little more nuanced, but under no circumstances, I do not think it is naive. Okay. Great. So uh, we we have a lot of people here today, and uh, I'm going to try to get in uh, a few questions anyway. Bashkim, are you ready? Yes, please. Okay, so you're hi, ready. Again, please. Uh, my name yeah, is Bashkim Ziberi. I'm a professor at the University of Tetova in uh, North Macedonia. Oh. And uh, it's a pleasure being here. I'm a former Fulbright, uh, for, uh, just spent one year at, in Boston, in Massachusetts. Oh, wonderful. Uh, two questions, small questions, please. First, for the uh, EU ambassador, uh, or if I'm not wrong, EU ambassador, yes. Okay. Um, uh, I think, uh, what do you think? Maybe Europe has too much internal problems in terms of uh, when it comes to building strategic partnership uh, with the US. Uh, let's say, for example, just today, uh, uh, Hungary and Poland uh, blocked the financial part uh, for the COVID-19. And okay. uh, uh, we have also differences uh, according to 5G. For example, European Union is allowing 5G, but uh, 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 Balkan countries where I'm coming from, we are more relying on, uh, let's say, uh, US, uh, US way of handling the 5G. And right, for, so Ambassador uh, Lamarinidis, why don't we, Lawrence, I think uh, we'll probably go with that, Bashkim, because we have so many questions, um, how we can overcome, or how, how, how to overcome uh, internal disagreement within, within the EU. So go ahead, Ambassador Lamarinidis, um, I think you're on mute. So, so let, me, let me focus on the, on the internal agreement, because I hear a lot about the disagreement, and you know, you have 27 uh, independent countries belonging to the European Union, you're always gonna have discussions. Uh, heck, I mean, if I look in the US, uh, the disagreements that I've seen in the past few years uh, and the polarization is, uh, is very, very big, but no one is questioning the unity of the US and no one should be questioning the unity of the EU. And I think that our friend from North Macedonia is a classic example. North Macedonia and Albania, uh, two countries that in the midst of COVID, in the midst of all these rumored problems in Europe, uh, were countries in which, uh, you know, um, accession uh, negotiations uh, officially began. I am very proud of that. Uh, this is the strength of Europe. And in fact, we ought to be underlying that strength. Uh, we ought to be looking that during COVID, that the European Union has given multiple billions of euros to ensure that medicines and PPE and other stuff like that go to the Western Balkan countries, precisely because they are a neighborhood and precisely because they are a family. Uh, so, uh, now, uh, when it comes to, uh, to internal issues with rule of law, and I think that that is a, a question that was implied when, when you talk about Hungary and Poland, we certainly have to, as European Union, uh, deal with the issue that foreign policy and defense policy is a priority, is still in the hands of member states. So we have joined in, uh, foreign policy action, of course, but these are still um, competences belonging in member states, and not all of them come from the same position, not all of them agree all the time. I think it's remarkable to see, nevertheless, uh, the, uh, the huge areas of agreement uh, and not focus on the, on, on the few ones of disagreement, not that they're not an issue, but let's look at the big picture. And when it comes domestically to rule of law, I have to say that we are taking that very seriously. We are a union based on values, it's in our treaties, based on uh, democracy, human rights, uh, equality, uh, non-discrimination, uh, all these things. Uh, and when we felt uh, in the past few years that uh, some member states uh, were reaching a point of potentially violating these values, 
we didn't shove that under the carpet. We did not not talk it because Brexit was happening. Some people were saying, oh, don't raise these issues because this may weaken Europe. Other people may leave. No, I think other people understood that our credibility uh, is uh, the biggest element of our strength and that our democracy is the biggest element of that credibility. We're not simply a union that is making money. And when you look at the COVID crisis now, the fact that we decided to, for the first time in our history, borrow together, all European countries guaranteeing those loans to go to the weakest of our member states, not to everyone equally, okay. to ensure that we can all rise according to our needs from this crisis. You see that solidarity. When you look at the uh, energy transition that we understand will not happen unless it is fair, and you look at the special fund we've put together, a multi-billion dollar fund, to support those regions and those people in Europe, in the coal industry, in other industries that will lose their jobs. But we're not telling the market, you figure it out. You let those people disappear. We're saying as Europe, we're gonna to together have to put the funding in to make sure that any change takes everyone into account. You see a, a Europe that is strong, united and solidaire, and that is what I would take away from this discussion uh, while, of course, focusing on the issues, they always are. But they are not defining the European future. Uh, it is the crisis and the unity coming out of them that defines it. And frankly, that makes me very optimistic that Americans and Europeans will be able together now, stronger and more united, to face the world challenges that we're discussing. Okay. So I think we're going to get a quick question. This time is, is not our friend today. Uh, from Raul, if you want to go but right for ahead. Nick, for Nick, please. For Nick. For Nick. Uh, okay, uh, uh, Raul, do you have a question for, for Nick or for either of the ambassadors? Well, for both. It has to do with the North Atlantic Alliance. I mean, we've been talking largely about the US vis-a-vis -vis the EU, but there are also important security matters that are handled not directly by the EU, but by NATO for both. And so my question to you both gentlemen is, would you differentiate between the responsibilities you think that NATO ought to have and those that ought to be unique to the EU with or without American participation? Okay. Who wants to go first? Well, thank you very much. Um, NATO is our most important military alliance in the world. It's our fundamental connection with Europe. We're not members of the EU, obviously, but we are a member of NATO. And um, you know, Donald Trump was the first American president since 1949 not to reaffirm Article 5 of the NATO Treaty that an attack on one of us shall be considered an attack on all. And that was a major mistake. It, it left open to question in the minds of our NATO allies, Canada and 28 European countries, whether or not the United States was truly committed to the defense of all the countries. Uh, and of course, Donald Trump became the leading critic of the NATO alliance as well. So I think you'll see Joe Biden embrace NATO. Um, Joe Biden in his last trip to Europe in February, 2019, this is a year and a half ago, gave a major speech at the Munich Security Conference where he said that NATO is the bedrock of the American position uh, with Europe. And, and we also have a partnership with the EU, which is fundamentally important. And he said at the end of this speech in Munich, he said, we'll be back, those Americans who believe in NATO. And he's right on his promise that uh, he's gonna lead us forward uh, and we're gonna return to the embrace of NATO. What's the mission of NATO? It's to secure everyone. I was ambassador to NATO on 9-11 in Brussels. I'll never forget when the European allies came to our defense and they said they go into Afghanistan with us and they did. They stood up for us at our darkest hour. The Europeans suffered over a thousand combat deaths in Afghanistan over the last 19 years. So you'll see in the Biden administration, my judgment is a full return to NATO. We've got to contain Russian power uh, in Eastern Europe. We have NATO battalions in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania and Poland. We've got to modernize our military technologies. And here I think almost everybody would agree with one of Donald Trump's points, Europe is not spending enough money on its defense. The Europeans collectively are not and individual countries, very few of them, only 10 right now, over the 2% floor, the threshold of GDP and defense. There's a lot that can be done here to modernize the militaries. President Trump went about it the wrong way he didn't recognize that the trend lines are positive, that most Europeans will hit that 2% target by 2024. He didn't give them credit for that. He was unnecessarily, I thought he was outright uncivil 
towards uh, Angela Merkel and Emmanuel Macron and Justin Trudeau, we're gonna have a, a very different president in Joe Biden, a very different vice president in Kamala Harris. And I think they'll be able to unify us with the NATO countries as well as the EU. And, 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 I, and I would say on my side that NATO is the bedrock of European security as well. Uh, and that uh, as Nick said, uh, uh, since Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, the European uh, member states have been spending much more on their defense, uh, more than 100 billion in the past few years, uh, increase in defense spending. At the same time, we've also understood that we have responsibilities in our neighborhood and around the world that have to be carried by us when it comes to defense. You don't hear much about piracy now off the Horn of Africa, but that, that was a major issue for those remembering a few years back. Uh, disrupting massively, uh, uh, you know, trade and other flows. And that's because of a European-led operation uh, that, uh, that has uh, fundamentally stopped it. Uh, and now when it comes to, uh, to Libya, we're also engaged in another operation to ensure that uh, illicit arms by sea, uh, at least, uh, but also monitoring air and land, uh, do not go into Libya to allow for proxy wars to happen. So we need a stronger EU there. And we decided the past few years that we're going to be spending more together and deploying more together. And we've been doing that. And that is not a European thing versus a NATO thing. I have to underline for people who don't know. It is, in fact, the direct contribution of Europe to NATO. We do not have a Greek army and a Greek NATO army or, you know, a German and a different one. Our national armies are our NATO armies. So the more efficiently we can spend, the better. Final point. Uh, everything that we can do to prevent conflicts around the world through strong diplomacy, uh, anything that we can do to reconstruct uh, destroyed parts of the world where unless people, refugees are able to return, they will stay out and they will get ra radicalized. Everything we can do there saves bullets. Defense is not just how many bullets I have. Defense is also ensuring that through my development aid, through my humanitarian aid, through my diplomacy, I managed to forcefully stop the bleeding around the world that leads to major conflicts. And that also has a price. And there, the European Union, too, is leading the world. So I think, and I am supremely hopeful what Nick said, that the, the re-emphasis on NATO and collective security is going to be the best thing uh, for European and American security, uh, but also will highlight uh, how reliable European partners are uh, today as well in this front. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, my friends, we have we have so many people, we have so many topics, we have such good speakers. We're going to try and fit in one very brief question and answer in about uh, four minutes total, uh, and then we'll we'll say goodbye. Uh, so, uh, Mojib, go right ahead, please. Sure. Thank you Let so much. Let us know who your question is for. Sure. My question is for both uh, panelists and good to okay. see you, Ambassador Burns. Um, the global war on terror has been characterized as one of the greatest strains on U.S.-EU relations. Uh, personally, as a first generation <laughs> American of Afghan descent, this issue is very important to me. Uh, now that peace in Afghanistan is closer than ever, what opportunities do you see in the transatlantic relationship as it relates to negotiating peace as well as keeping it in Afghanistan? Okay, great. Who, who would like to Go first in our lightning last round. Nick. Well, um, Majid, thank you so much for that question. Um, I do. I personally think it's time to draw to a conclusion the two big land wars that we've been fighting really for 20 years in both Iraq and Afghanistan. I think we're, it's right to have negotiations with the Taliban as well, of course, as the Afghan national government. Um, I would hope very much that the United States would strike a very tough deal with the Taliban. I worry that President Trump is so desperate uh, for some kind of foreign policy victory before he leaves office, and he will leave office at noon on January 20th, that he might be too soft on the Taliban. We shouldn't rush this. Um, the people I listen to are the people who've been American ambassadors to that country, and a number of them believe that we need to be patient here and make sure that the, that the negotiations are in the interest of preserving the authorities of the Afghan national government. The United States should, of course, draw down its troops when that happens. But we're also going to need to have a military capacity in the Afghan Pakistan area to try to deal with the continuing threats from terrorism 
And, and that's going to be true in the Middle East as well. So um, yes, for a negotiated end of the Afghan war, but intelligently, toughly, where we actually protect our friends uh, in the government in Kabul and don't give any kind of advantage to the Taliban. That's what I think would be a fair way uh, to negotiate the end of this war. Okay. And I have to say, I have to say, I fully agree with Nick, and uh, and I'm very grateful that he mentioned before uh, how Europeans and Americans together on the ground in Afghanistan has been have been fighting and dying uh, sometimes, um, and that's uh, one of the most classic examples of of Americans and Europeans, um, um, you know, uh, putting the money where the mouth is really, and and standing up for uh, security, peace, and and values uh, in Afghanistan values. Are as relevant as anywhere else. Uh, the uh, the gains in women's rights in the past 20 years have been remarkable, uh, and we will be bearing a huge uh, weight and responsibility if uh, we uh, do not approach the resolution of this uh, conflict, which has to be through negotiations. Um, if we do not approach it, also keeping in mind that many things can go wrong, and it's not just more violence, but it it's also creating a society that is precisely not the one that we hope to see um, perpetuating around the world. We have a responsibility to those women, in my view at least, uh, and we have to take that uh, seriously as well. And certainly that's an area where Europe is extremely ready to, uh, to come in, um, participating um, uh, in those discussions, ensuring that the outcome uh, is one that is sustainable, that together with the US and others, and then, uh, if that happens, uh, participating massively in support to rebuild and to support the country in its institutions and structures, um, because uh, in the end of the day, uh, any agreement uh, will have to prove itself on the ground, and there you need real reconstruction, and that's where the EU can play a huge role as well and will. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have a, a huge shared agenda, it sounds like, um, and we have a huge number of participants, a huge number of questions, but no time left. So I guess I have to finish with huge thanks uh, to Ambassador Lambertinidis and huge thanks to Ambassador Burns. Um, let's continue the discussion. Um, and thank you, everyone, for, for tuning in and supporting us. And can I say once again, what, before, you, before you switch off your things, Nick, okay. it's such a just a pleasure. It's a real pleasure all the time. And you see why Nick and I like each other, because we never mince any words. I mean, Nick has this tremendous capacity to focus on the precise issues, uh, to ask for precise answers. And this is exactly what he will see in Europe today. Uh, you know, platitudes are not the order of the day anymore. We have real problems in the world, and we have to get to real solutions address the irritants, uh, but really focus on the future. Nick, it's been a pleasure as always, it's really a real pleasure. Tavros, thank you. And I think both of us can thank uh, World Boston and Mary uh, for hosting us today. And thanks to everyone who attended. Okay, thanks everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye.